Here is yet another video of pioneering proofs. And today I will provide the full derivation of the Taylor series formula. So this video has been, uh, you know, I've been working on this video for like over a year actually. <laughs> and I, you know, just yesterday I just had some insight that, you know, completed this journey. And so without further ado, let us begin. Now to begin this proof, let's look at the fundamental theorem of calculus. As you can see, you have an expression for f of x if you rearrange the variables. And that term in there, you could express it as uh, itself multiplied by 1. And you could use integration by parts to expand it. Hmm, interesting. And now we take that expression and actually apply the integration by parts. Uh, yeah, <laughs> cool animation. Uh, so, as you can see, we're keeping this general, so we want to have a C right there. So I have the future version of myself, for many moons in the future. We'll explain to you now how you can apply integration by parts an unlimited number of times. So you start with a general rule for integration by parts, and now you have a specific function that you want to expand using the integration by parts. And now, we see that it follows the same form as the rule, so we can expand it right over here. And so, you'll actually notice that that term on the end can also be expanded because it follows the same general form. And so, we can actually apply this and a limited number of times because um, now we're back to that same form it's just nested so um, it doesn't matter which iteration you're on you can just still apply it whatever you want which is pretty cool so in the previous slide we saw that we could uh, use integration by parts as many times as we want uh, which is very important and also C can be any value that we want that's also very important because uh, you'll see that later. And uh, I just want to stress the fact that c could actually be any function of a vector v such that v does not include t because it has to be a constant from, from the perspective of t. All right, so we have this term over here and we have, uh, oh yeah, upon further simplification, uh, we can see that within those square brackets, we have two terms that both involve C. We have a derivative uh, evaluated at x on the left, uh, multiplied by x plus C, and a derivative of uh, evaluated at x naught, multiplied by x naught plus C on the right. So what we're gonna do is that we're going to choose a value for C, such that one of those two terms are eliminated, because we want things to get simple, not more complicated. So we could either choose, uh, let's see, negative x to cancel out the one on the left, or a negative x naught to cancel out the one on the right. So which one do we want to use? Well, of course, using Occam's razor logic, um, we want to do, you know, cancel out the one that uh, causes the least amount of uh, problems, or, you know, the more simple one. And we can see that on the right-hand side, we just have a derivative evaluated at x time. So, it's just going to be a constant. So, um, so that's a term that we want to keep, because that's going to be a whole lot more simple than a derivative evaluated at x, which is going to be a whole lot of, uh, you know, complex terms, all this stuff. So we're going to choose negative x to be our c value. And so we have this over here, 
the left side cancels out. And then we have this over here. And it simplifies to the derivative of f of t with respect to t, evaluated at t is equal to x naught multiplied by x minus x naught. And the c value is negative x over there too. And here's the results of the first integration by parts <clears throat> over here. So we proceed with the second integration by parts. And we expand the expandable term. And we get this right over there. And things get a whole lot more simple if we just set c to equal to 0. There we go. We shall proceed by distributing the minus sign. And we shall proceed once more by evaluating the integral, eliminating the zero term, distributing the minus sign. At this point, your eagle eyes may have noticed that in this term you have an x naught minus x instead of an x minus x naught like you had on the previous term. However, this could be fixed because um, uh, x naught minus x is equal to negative x minus x naught. And so then if you square that, negative signs cancel out, and thus you can reverse the terms right there so that you have an x minus x naught right there. And then here's the results of the second integration by parts. On this slide, we will investigate an emerging pattern. So right over here is the, re is the result of expanding the first integration by parts. And here is a result of the expansion after the second integration by parts. Notice that the form of the expandable integral terms in these yellow boxes follow the general form of some factor q multiplied by the integral from uh, x naught to x of the mth derivative of f of t uh, with respect to t multiplied by t minus x to the m minus 1 power. And so this factor q can either be negative 1 or 1. And the integral term resulting from the first integration by parts follows this form such that m is equal to 2. But it's going to be important to note that the value for m over here is even. Additionally, q is equal to 1, or sorry, negative 1. And uh, for the uh, integral term from the second integration by parts, m is odd and q is equal to positive 1. In the next slides, we will examine these two cases more closely because they will be important for deriving the formula for the Taylor series. These are actually the only two cases that will show up in this Taylor series. So they form the complete set of all types of integral terms that you will encounter. But we'll get to that soon enough. So let's examine the first case. Let us now consider this first case where we must expand an integral using integration by parts that follows the general form we discussed before with a q value of negative 1 and an m value of an even integer. So we can be at any point in our Taylor series such that the expandable integral is of this particular form, which will occur every two terms or every two expansions. Anyway, let's expand this integral, assuming that all future integration constants are set to 0. And there's our first simplification. And we're going to move it up to here. And let's continue to simplify. And simplify some more. All right, so let's stop right over here for a minute. Uh, right over here. So remember. During the second integration by parts, when we had that problem 
in which we had uh, x down minus x in the parentheses instead of x minus x naught? Well, we have the same problem here, but we already know how to solve it or, you know, fix it. We can switch uh, the order to x minus x naught because the negative signs will just cancel out when it when it's raised to an even power. So there we go. And we can switch the order because it's raised to an, e <clears throat> to an even power. And then we can expand that term in red, or you know the expandable integral term. And then we can make it disappear. And then we can simplify, then make it disappear. And if you didn't notice this already, we have another one of those x naught minus x problems as highlighted here in red. This x naught minus x in red is raised to the m plus 1th power, meaning that it is raised to a power of an odd integer, since we assume that m is an even integer. Uh, this means that we, will, that we will be left with a negative sign in front of this expression. And we have this negative sign because m plus 1 is odd. And then we continue to simplify. And now we have this equation over here. Make it disappear. And we can expand the expression to obtain this one over here. And now, that we, and now at this point, you may notice something interesting. We can actually find a more general expression for the expression right here on the right side of this equal sign. You know, in the orange right there. And I'll show you what I mean by this in the next slide. Okay, so we have this equality over here, uh, but now we can sort of generalize it. Notice the expandable integral term in the yellow box, and that it follows the same expansion rule as the parent expansion, except we just multiply uh, we, except, you know, we just multiply everything by 1 over m times m plus 1. And we do the expansion with m plus 2 instead of with m. Now let's expand this term. <laughs> um, and we can continue to expand the expandable integral term at the end of each expansion by substituting in the value of m for your current expansion and adding 2. Additionally, uh, know that there's a pattern. There's actually a, um, uh, right. Yeah, so there's a pattern in the form of your non-expandable terms as highlighted in the green boxes. So as you add um, each term, you multiply by an additional value of m plus an integer going up by increments of 1. And the order of the derivatives also goes up by increments of 1. And in the unexpanded in expandable integral term, at the end, the derivative will be the same order as the last non-expandable term. And it will also be multiplied by the same, by the same factor, consisting of successive multiplications of m plus an integer in the denominator. I know that what I said on the previous slide may sound like complete and utter rubbish, but hopefully you saw the pattern in those green boxes. And all right, so the following expression fully captures this pattern. Uh, this expression right over here. Uh, yeah, it fully captures the pattern that we saw in the former expression, as explained in the previous slide. So now we can set m. So now that we have this, we can set m equal to 2 and substitute this expression into that yellow box right there. And something I forgot to mention on the previous slide is that we, were, we are able to um, set m is equal to 2 because, because 2 is an even number. And we said that m must be an even number. All right, so now, now that we set m equal to 2, and substitute the resulting expression into our Taylor series. Uh, uh, note that the upper bound of our summation, uh, capital I sub E, must be an 
even integer because of the way that we derived it. And this, of course, makes sense. Uh, whoops, I forgot the animations. So with this formula, we almost have the Taylor series, but we can only expand the summation to an even number of terms. So we can only expand to like, you know, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 terms. So let us now move on to examining the second case. Let us consider the case where we must expand an integral using integration by parts that follows the general form we discussed before with a Q value a positive one and an m value of an odd integer. So it can be at any point in Taylor series such that, that the expandable integral term is of this particular form, which will occur every two terms or every two expansions, uh, every two expansions. Uh, so all right, so now let's expand this integral setting all future integration constants equal to zero. OK, there we go. And expand the term. And simplify. Simplify. <laughs> so at this point, if you possess eagle eyes, you may have noticed that we have an x not minus x instead of an x minus x not, once again. And we know how to fix this problem. Since m is odd this time, we simply say that the expression is x minus x naught raised to the nth power multiplied by negative 1. And it simplifies to this because m is odd. And now we can proceed to take that expandable integral term and expand it, then make it disappear. And the simplification will reappear in its place, disappearing again. And here's another eagle eyes alert. We solve the x on minus x issue by simply rearranging the expression in the parentheses such that it becomes x minus x naught since m is odd and thus m plus 1 is even. Disappear. And we proceed because. Uh, you know, m plus 1 is even, we can do that. Uh, disappear? Yeah. And then simplify. Disappear. And now we have reached the following equality right over there in blue. Disappear. And we expand it to obtain the expression in orange. And here comes the, you know, the more complicated step. Uh, but we're just following the same logic as the first case, uh, except now that, uh, except now q is equal to positive one and m is odd instead of q being equal to negative one and m is even. You know, you know, now q is positive one and m is odd, and you know we can ge generalize this expression to obtain this new expression with that summation and the uh, multiplication operators. And we assume that m was an odd integer. So the upper bound of our summation, uh, i sub 0, must also be an odd, an odd integer. So again, similar to the previous case, uh, we almost have the Taylor series. We're so close. But we can only expand the summation in orange to an odd number of terms, like, you know, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, uh, uh. All right, so now we can take the two cases we discussed. And, you know, when q is equal to negative 1 and m is even, and q is equal to positive 1 and m is odd, and we can actually combine them. We can put it together to actually get this Taylor series in some kind, you know, in a raw and unprocessed form. Like, you know, so the Taylor series. So we have the formula for an expansion to an even number of terms, and the formula for an expansion to an odd number of terms. But how do we get the formula for an expansion to, like, you know, any i number of terms, whether it be even or odd? Well, I will answer this question today.
<laughs> right now. I will answer this question. Uh, so note that in both cases, all uh, right, the animation has to go first. Um, yeah. So note that in both cases, summation and expandable integral terms are exactly the same. So the only difference between the two expressions uh, is that plus or minus sign in the middle in red. And we know that the set of all integers is the union of the set of all even integers and the set of all odd integers. So we can simplify, we can simple, simply combine combine the expression, or sorry, the summation terms into a single expression in which the upper bound of the index variable can be both even and odd, representing the complete set of positive integers. Also, the expandable integral terms can be a single term, and we can alternate the sign in the red box depending on whether you choose to expand to an even or odd number of terms. And we can do this by raising one to a power, as I will explain in the next slide. Whoops, I said raising one to a power when I meant to say raising negative one to a power. That's a small mistake. Uh, so after combining the even and odd cases, we obtain the Taylor series. But it's in a raw and unprocessed form, but still the Taylor series. Um, and as I mentioned in the previous slide, our upper, upper bound of the summation can be both even and odd integers. And we will call this upper bound capital I, at least for now. And note that we can express the correct sign linking the summation uh, as the summation, oh, sorry, linking the summation and the expandable integral, integral term by multiplying by negative one to a power, specifically raised to a power of I plus one. This ensures that the sign is positive one for odd values of I corresponding to an odd number of terms and negative one for even values of I corresponding to an even number of terms. So now if we define a new variable N that indicates the nth term in the series expansion from left to right uh, with the first term corresponding to n is equal to 1, then we have this new expression right over here, where capital N is the new upper bound instead of capital I, and it, and it represents the number of terms that you want that you want in your expansion. So you can choose to expand to any number of terms, um, and that number of terms will be your n value. Also note that we were able to convert the successive multiplications over i to factorials over n. And so now you may recognize that both f of x naught and the second term, which is the uh, derivative of f of t with respect to t evaluated at t is equal to x naught, multiplied by x minus x naught. So you may notice that these terms follow the exact same form in the summation for when n is equal to 0 and for n is equal to 1, respectively. So we can account for the two terms before the summation, uh, be, before n is equal to 2, uh, in the summation by simply starting the summation at n is equal to 0. So we will capture all of that information by making this simple change. So here we have the Taylor series in its final form, actually. Well, I mean, kind of, but oh yeah, so there's one more minute detail that I want to mention before we proceed, and it's that, you know, if we have f of x, then, you know, what's that t doing right there? You know, like, how do we, how do we get this formula if we have a t, but we have f in terms of an x? How do we do it? And the answer to this question is actually pretty simple. Uh, t is actually what we call a dummy variable. So when performing calculations, we may simply substitute t for x. But there actually is a better way to think about it. Uh, it's the way that I like to think about it. And it's that um, we're actually approximating the function f of t. So we're not approximating f of x, we're approximating the function f of t. So t is the variable in its domain. But x is a specific, specific value of t. So, 
So yeah, so what we're doing is that we're approximating a specific specific value of our function that is a function of t, and the specific value will be located at t is equal to x. And so if that's true, then what is x naught in this equation? Well, x naught is, you know, it can be anything. It can be any value you want it to be. But um, the thing about x naught is that the closer you are to x naught, the better your approximation will be. It's because um, uh, it's because of that error term. I'll, I'll get into that soon. <laughs> I haven't gotten to there yet. Uh, I'll explain later. And by explain later, I mean explain now. <laughs> so, uh, so there you have it. Uh, this is the expanded form of the, your uh, of your function. But it's not quite yet the Taylor series. And you may be asking, well, why not? And it's because the integral term we see on the right side of the plus sign will almost always approach zero as capital N approaches infinity. This term is called the error term. And if we want the Taylor series approximation, then we simply drop this error term. We drop it from this equation. And what this error term tells you is how close your approximation, it tells you exactly how close your approximation is to the actual value of your function uh, at t is equal to x. And so what I was saying earlier on the previous side was that, um, uh, right, so was that, so if you have x naught, if you center your function around x naught, and you choose a value of x that is pretty close to x naught, then your approximation will actually be better. Uh, oh, right. It's because of this error term. Uh, it's because that this error term will be greater for values further away from x naught. OK, so now we have the final expression for the Taylor series approximation of a function f of t, where x is a particular value of t, and also an expression for the corresponding error that tells you exactly how close your approximation was to the actual value of your function at t is equal to x. All right, so that was the complete derivation of the Taylor series formula, of the Taylor series approximation formula. and I'm pretty glad about how this video turned out. It turned out pretty good. And um, yeah, so have a great day. And if it's nighttime, then I hope you awaken fully rejuvenated the next morning in good health.